Hello, everyone. Welcome to Hauser & Wirth. I'm Russell Salmon, Director of Public Programs here at the Gallery. We are thrilled to welcome you here this evening on behalf of Hauser & Wirth Movie and The Office for a celebration of the exclusive worldwide streaming release of William Kentridge's brilliant series, Self-Portrait as a Coffee Pot. Filming for the series began in Kentridge's Johannesburg studio during the COVID-19 lockdown in 2020 and was completed in 2023. Following special previews at Toronto International Film Festival and BFI London Film Festival and its presentation at the Arsenale Institute for the Politics of Representation curated by Carolyn Kristov Bakargiev during the Venice Biennale of Art 2024, which ends next month, the series was acquired and has has been released by MUBI to stream exclusively on their platform. Tonight, we're honored to welcome artist William Kentridge, renowned for his animated drawings for projection, as well as his sculpture, theater, and opera productions, for a conversation with artist Martine Sims, moderated by New Yorker writer and critic Vincent Cunningham. After the conversation this evening, you are all welcome to join us in the Roth Bar and the Bookshop for a drink to further celebrate. Before we get started, I have some very special people to thank. Thank you to our friends at the office and MUBI for their gracious collaboration on tonight's program, Noah Beshevkin and Rachel Chanoff at the office, as well as Ibti Omer, Irene Musumechi, and Sanam Garagozlu at MUBI, all of whom were pivotal in making this evening a reality. From the Hauser & Wirth team, thank you to our presidents, Ivan and Manuela Wirth and Mark Payo, as well as Anders Bergstrom, Marigold Freeland, Fiona Romer, Ellie Hawley, Carolina Sabater, and Angelique Owens for all their support on this program. On your seats this evening is a custom William Kentridge designed movie tote bag, which includes a limited edition zine produced in honor of the series and also designed in collaboration with William Kentridge. If you didn't get one, there are more outside as well. Thank you all again for being here. Before we begin this evening's conversation, please enjoy Mubi's beautiful trailer for William Kentridge's self-portrait as a coffee pot. When I was three years old, I wanted to be an elephant. I failed at that, so I was reduced to being an artist. The studio is both a physical place and a metaphoric space. It's a place of making and of making meaning. I prefer the solitary act of drawing. I prefer the companionship of collaborators. One of the hard things to realize is the edge of who one is, of what your imagination can produce. This is the job of the studio, to turn that which is invisible into something visible. So you start thinking you'll do a picture of the whole universe, but you end up with a coffee pot. Now, please join me in welcoming William Kentridge, Martine Sims, and Vincent Cunningham. Uh, it is so good to be with you uh, and several of our best friends, our closest friends here. <laughs> Close <laughs> being the operative word here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, there, there are so many directions that we could go in with this conversation because um, your work, this work, William, is so multivalent. It goes in so many directions. But maybe instead of thinking about the infinity of directions, we could talk about one of the main themes of this series, which is foreclosing possibilities. Um, in an early episode, you talk about how the um, Torschluss panic, the, uh, <laughs> the panic that emerges when, when 
possibilities are foreclosed upon um, and how maybe mark making is a series of doors closed. Um, I wonder, I'd love to hear both of you talk about that. William, how do you, how do you think about that? Well, the, uh, just to explain, in the first episode, after about 30 seconds, I refer to this German phrase, Torschlusspanik, the panic induced by the closing doors. Suddenly, one exit is closed off, and you're limited in what you can do. And the first thing was that it was a good argument to have with the producer to say, could such a strange word be in, or would that mean everybody switches and stops listening after 35 <laughs> seconds? So I'm very happy it was, it was in. Um, there's something about making a mark with charcoal which is kind of indeterminate. Mm -hmm. It's a smudge. It's sometimes, you know, if, you, if you're writing with a sharp pen, as you know, with a sharp pencil, you can see where the point hits the paper, and you can direct it fairly accurately. But if you've got a blunt stick of charcoal in your hand, you hope you know roughly where it's going to land, and you put a mark down, and it kind of delays foreclosure. Mm -hmm. That could be a shoulder, it could be a horizon. It's, it's vague enough to be both. Let it keep the possibilities open. And gradually, of course, as the marks accumulate, they do stop all the other things happening. But also with charcoal, because it's such a light, uh, powdery medium with a cloth, you can reopen the door and mm -hmm. wipe it off. Um, but ultimately, of course, one hopes one can cover all subjects and you discover you're coming back to the same subject again and again. <laughs> Is that how, how does that feel for you, Martinez? Yeah, I was just thinking about keeping the door open. I feel like that's key. And even not using charcoal, but for myself trying to like go down a path, but then also find the rabbit holes and keep that possibility open. Um, so when you're describing charcoal, like being able to wipe it away or erase it and then work into it, I think that's something I like to do in images or with projects is keep working into them. <coughs> I think, I mean, the idea of, I suppose, for animation, to the, mm. that it keeps provisionality very present, um, that it's not a fact, it's part of a process. And it could stop here or it could go on further. So whether it's erasure or keeping extra doors that can be opened or extra rabbit holes to go down, um, is a, it's both, I think, a strategy for making work, but it's also, of course, a kind of a way of understanding the world outside of the studio. Speaking of the studio, it does seem to be like the site of this indeterminacy, this in-between place that it almost seems like you want to keep open for as long uh, as you can. And we are here to celebrate a sort of um, a going out into the world. Um, does that feel like also a sort of closing of the studio door behind you? Or? Um, it's certainly a closing of the, of the, you know, of this particular project. It's now out in the world. It takes its chance. We're, all, you know, all of us who worked on the project for four years worked saying we hoped it would land somewhere that some way would be seen. So it's fantastic that Mubi is, is showing it. In the <laughs> thank you, Mubi. Uh, big thank you. Big thank you. Big thank you, Mubi, because it's, yeah, it's like making a drawing, you know, you hope that the process of, it's not as if you know the drawing in advance, but the process of making it is also the process of discovering what the drawing is. And when the drawing's finished, then there's the, you've arrived there. Um, so it's the same with the series. There was a kind of an openness all the way. How would it fit together? What would be the topics? What would be the form? And in the end, it kind of consolidates and for better or worse, you're left with what is what is there? So I think that completion is obviously also important. Yeah, I think about that sometimes as, as just like the getting in my way is the way. And like, like just having watched the series, part of what's really exciting about it is it actually feels accurate to being in the studio and the conversations you have with yourself or the process of making and then unmaking something and then it's interesting to have it be sort of done. I'm curious. I'm not going to ask a question. <laughs> please, yes, please. <laughs> what, um, like, how do you feel watching it? Like, do you see closed doors? Do you see, like, ah, oh, we should have done that thing? Or, 
Yeah, I should have kept that in, which I know in, in yeah. an episode there is... I'm sure episode. that you also find it that when the project is finished, you kind of say, okay, now I know where we should begin, how, yeah. we, should, how we should do it, but you can't really go back to the producers and say, do you think we could have another four years and scrap that? <laughs> and, and also in the knowledge that if you think you can do that, you suddenly discover... God, they knew what they were doing then. Why can't I do it again? That it's the it's the blessing of not knowing what you're doing the first time you do it is kind of that one wishes one could hold on to. And so I think there are a lot of strategies of trying to be in that position of not being in control and discovering yeah. what it is. Um, yeah, but the, I mean, for me, the studio is a very central physical space as well as, a, as, well as the kind of the metaphoric space of of making it. I wonder for you if it's also... Yeah, I love... I actually, the show I just finished is, has... It's kind of about my studio as well. The studio as a kind of set. And as a set. Yeah, which in some ways... Yes, it is. It's completely. setting completely. here. Even when I'm by myself, so there is a kind of like performance to being in it. Or Earlier we were talking about studio visits, which I'm not the biggest fan of. <laughs> <laughs> But they feel sometimes really like performative or you're like, or my work doesn't look like anything for a while. So if somebody <laughs> comes in when it doesn't look like anything, you're like, my trick is to make them an espresso. <laughs> <laughs> or, walk, or walk around or to have the walk around the studio. I mean, it is, it's a little bit as you know, the, the, the anxiety of, how do I make this look like a studio for the for the film <laughs> and act, act like you're drawing when you're busy drawing? Um, so there is. So before, in fact, with a lot of the scenes, particularly when I'm trying to think, what are we doing in the scene? What are we doing in the scene? Because there's no script or storyboard for any of the episodes. Um, but there would be, um, for where I'm talking to myself, I'd write a, a brief dialogue so that I knew what one person because we filmed it twice, that's why I'd have the first text and then I could shift to be filmed as the second person and try to remember what the other person had said and what the answers should be and where to look. So a lot of that moment, that anxiety, would be spent endlessly rearranging the studio, moving the book forward, going back to the camera and checking the frame. And it's a, it was both kind of framing it for the filming, but it was also a kind of procrastination. <laughs> a sort of a... <laughs> Just a little yeah. excitement Getting for the guys. lighting just right, slightly <laughs> dramatic. This is episode 10 is being <laughs> yeah. filmed right now. We're so But making coffee in the studio, I think that's, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's, uh, yeah, the one does. One has to yeah. find different. And to find I'm interested or I'm not interested, I try to convince myself <laughs> falsely that all these uh, procrastinations are in fact productive. So yeah. I think of them as a productive procrastination. Well, speaking of this dialogue that you uh, continually, that threads through the piece between the self and the self, um, it seems to me that this is part of the experience of being alone with work. I'm glad that the convention of the studio visit does not exist for writers because it would just be me lodging recriminations at myself, just a series of heightening insults. Um, and, uh, but with you, with this kind of dialectic between someone that feels like an artist and somebody who's an editor, a dreamer and a very practical person, um, the sort of, the person who's almost like a sort of minimalist and a maximalist, um, I wonder how that process that that self-talk uh, lives for you on a day-to-day -day basis and how you decided to then make it manifest on screen. One of the shocking, not shocking, one of the, old, I suppose, inevitable things, I had the two people talking and then I suddenly asked, this is my father's, the one voice is my father, the, the skeptic of what is the value of this, what are you actually doing, is this necessary? And the other one desperately saying, it's not necessary, that makes it essential. I'm trying to think, <laughs> who am I convincing with that kind of answer? Um, so there are those kinds of uh, anxieties. You know, it's, it's, I'm sure it's very hard. There's, at a certain point, is this, there was a story of uh, James Thurber, the writer, mm -hmm. uh, the humorist, and um, he tried to work out what his, his, the, the woman who cleaned the house made of him, that he just stayed at home writing. Mm -hmm. And uh, he decided her view of him was that he was well enough to be let out of the asylum, but not well enough to go to actual work. <laughs> <laughs> and it kind of kills that. Is that, is that where we hover in this? Is it entirely... Uh, 
you know, it is a, a self a self reflective process, but one hopes that it will eventually go out and be looked at other people. And so those, that condition of doubt, of doubting oneself, which I'm sure all writers have, you write something and it seems great, and then you reread it and you become the critic, and you say, not me, I couldn't have written that, someone yeah. else wrote that. If I'd written it, it would be so much better than that. <laughs> so I think that, that condition is very evident in the, in the studio, and this is just kind of making that, saying, well, let's play with that as the starting point, as a given. There's a book, Inner Game of Tennis, Mm. also inner game of golf that has a self one and self two. It's all about the self-talk. So do you talk to yourself a lot when you're in the studio? Um, I don't talk to myself, but I'm aware each time you take it. I mean, the animation, the animation, the general process, there's a drawing on the wall and there's a camera five yards away mm -hmm. and you do a drawing and then you turn your back and walk to the camera and shoot a frame and you turn back to the drawing and in that turning back that moment of turning you suddenly see it again mm. and then you kind of give yourself not necessarily a recrimination but an instruction yes that's moving to the right height or slow it down it's too dark oh no you've lost it go back and you've messed it up now so that kind of dialogue does float in and out and I mean I think that and it's that's a normal process in the studio but I think what I was also interested in is that a process that everyone has is just not as self-evident as it might be in the studio we always know we're constructing ourselves every day out of all these different possible selves and different fragments and sometimes we're of it am I going to lose my temper no I'll actually hold back and feel yourself <laughs> holding back and and of course we often have the thing of we don't know what we're going to say until we say it. We trust our brains will make a coherent sentence. But we're all aware of, oh, this is what I should have said. Oh, if only I'd said that, that would have smashed them. And you try to go through <laughs> of rehearsing sentences. And in anticipation of difficult conversations, one kind yeah. of invents a whole dialogue in one's head, which never, seldom comes to pass. So that's, that's there, not as literally. Do you have conversations with yourself? All the time, constantly. But coherent ones. And how, yeah. is, your, how is your self-talk? I don't want to be a therapist, but how, how is, what is the quality of that dialogue? It's pretty good. Some, some days are rough. <laughs> but generally, I try to be a friend to myself. Uh -huh. But I am a critic. Okay. <laughs> and yeah, some days, doubts. But I just talk like how you described going, uh, move that a little down. No, not like that. Like, I say that out loud all the and time. The other one at the door says, I don't know what you mean. I don't know what you mean. When you left or right, you say, move it. Which way? Be clear. And they say, just look at it. Look at it. You can see it's wrong. I said, I can't see it's wrong. And, uh, you do have yeah. one has that kind yeah, of exactly. conversation. Don't you? It goes in and out from being verbal or interior and verbal. Uh, speaking of talk and dialogue, William, one of the other sort of dialectics that occurs between these two selves is um, one of them is more of a sort of high-flown talker and talks about the, the panoply of rhetorical devices uh, that he likes to employ, the sort of um, the richness of language and all that it brings. Um, I'm interested in this for both of you, but William, where does language live in your practice? Is it, is, it's, is it intrinsic to your practice? Is it a, an aid to get the ideas it's, it's in your both. work across? Yeah. There's a, I, I keep a notebook in the studio, which is just called Words. It's written outside. With, and it is, when reading other writers, proper writers, um, I often underline or make a note of particular phrases, either because they have a strange riddle to them that I don't understand, or because they suddenly encapsulate. They're largely poets, but not exclusively poets, and so there's this compendium of phrases. And often when working on a project, I'll flip through those, and sometimes when working on a theater project, maybe take out a hundred of them and literally have them typed out and then cut up on the table and then arrange them, not by chance, but to see, but without clear plan, to see what sort of things are emerging. Uh, and so there's often great language because it's not mine, it's, it's found language, it's you know, the best people have been writing for thousands of years. Um, and it does become, it's become more important mm -hmm. recently. 
But I'm also interested in non-language, words at the edge of meaning, where or language at the edge of meaning, either completely crazy like Dadaist, uh, Kurzschwitter's Ur Sonata, which is about the collapse of language, or particularly things which are at the edge of meaning, where you think you can almost grasp what they mean, but you can't quite solve the riddle. Um, so unsolved riddles, or mm -hmm. that for me is in it. It's because it, I think what happens then is that you're pushed into an agency of, oh, and complicity into the making of meaning. I mean, there's the, there's in one of the episodes, there's the, which was just a, um, a straight history, a straight example. The two of, in this case, it's the two selves talking, but it came from talking to a friend where uh, I'd asked him what his partner was doing. We were on the phone, and he said, oh, his, uh, his friend was making a tree search. And I thought, okay, I've never heard the word tree search. And then I thought, of course, a tree search, it's the internet term for following a subject. You, you follow the stem of the main subject, and you go up the branches, and it tells you all the different uh, sub-subjects, and it's their little dialogue boxes and all of these things. That's a, mm. a tree search, it's obvious. And at the, <laughs> and of, co at the, of course, of course. And at, yeah. the, at, the end of the, at the end of the conversation, I said to my friend, tell me, what was Adrian researching? And he said, what do you mean, what is he researching? And I said, you said he was making a tree search. And he said, no, I didn't. I said, he was making a t-shirt. <laughs> so, so what that was about, what I was interested in there, was the panic of feeling stupid. Yeah. It was that panic of feeling, I don't know what a tree search is, I don't know what a tree search is, and then the super ego, supercharged, comes in saying, of course we'll do, we'll, and it invents the whole solution in a nanosecond. It all appears in your head in that moment. And so that sense of the panic of not understanding, of yeah. not comprehending, and what we will do to try to jump over that and complete it. I think that's what I was interested in. Mm. So in mistranslation, in almost understanding. Martin, how about you? Where does, the, where does language, I mean, there's a lot of language in your work, whether it's, uh, whether it's a script writing or otherwise. What, how, how does it work for you? I mean, I think one thing is I'm really attuned to like speech. Mm -hmm. So, like, people listening to how people talk and thinking about miscommunications or just kind of what you described, where there'll be uh, a break in understanding or kind of unknown, mm -hmm. and how people try to, like, bridge the gaps. Um, also, words that don't mean anything that people use to kind of fill in stuff, like... Um, you know, even when people are like telling a story and they're just like da 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 da, like that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Like I like those kind of rhythms, mm -hmm. like the rhythms of speech. So that's usually where it starts. And also, no. But what I was going to say that astonished me when you know watching many films, but watching your films, I thought, how does she know how people speak? <laughs> um, I think, you know, I have a particularly wooden ear for for speech, and I know that dialogue is an impossible thing for me to try to to try to write, and so I think, okay, I believe it. I believe all the people talking in your film. When I try to write script, I know, okay, this is bad theater, bad theater, bad theater. <laughs> the dialogue. So I think that, that also kind of structured the, how these had to be, because I couldn't try to imagine what somebody else was saying. I just managed to imagine what I might say. Um, and even then, there were a lot of, every now and then there'd be one of the dialogues I was writing, and then I'd say, no, this is like bad theater, just, out and out and out. But then it's kind out. of nice you have the other character to kind of like yeah. bad theater, you know? Yeah. Like if you write some, as you're yeah. writing the two voices. But I was curious about that as I was watching, like, so when you would start the day of shooting, you said there's no storyboard, you're improvising, you're using the work that's already in the studio. How did you, did you just consult your book of words of like what you're thinking about? No, it's not quite, a, I mean, no, it's, it's less. <laughs> so I would know that, um, I knew that the second episode was, or one of the things, one of the, the second episode was going to be about landscape. Gotcha. So I thought, all right, let me do two different landscapes. So I put up two sheets of paper and uh, had the camera, the fixed cameras in the room and started drawing one which is going to be a drawing that I remembered from childhood, or drawing of a painting I remembered from childhood, and the other is going to be a... And 
the camera would be rolling and I'd be working on one and then working on the other and I thought, okay, I know in the one I've been drawing with rulers, so hold it in your head, let's go back to the other one and also draw with rulers so that when they edit it together we can have this. So it's kind of being aware of the camera filming it, but using the time, and that was like two days or two and a half days of doing those two landscapes to think what the hell comes next, what the hell comes next, what can it be about? And then the idea of a vanishing point as a topic came in, which was in fact a productive, it was a different thought to what I'd had about landscape before, so it was a, a useful, but so it's not random, it's not random images. And then I would try to track down the landscape further. And I knew that episode was going to end with a section of a film I'd made a couple mm -hmm. of a year before. Uh, just because to make a full animated film for each episode, each animated film might take nine months. So to make a series of those is just not, not realistic. So to use some material that existed and a lot of material that was made. In, under the camera that moment. Right. Yeah. It was imp improv improvised. improvised. So. Mm. Speaking of improvisation, and you mentioned theater and theatricality, I wonder what it's like to be, what performance, obviously theater is a big part of your practice, but you, yourself as a performer specifically, what that provided for you, do you think of yourself as a performer in a way that you hadn't earlier uh, in your work? Um, I used to, I did, I acted with different theater groups as a university student. And then afterwards, when I was at art school, I went on with some of this and had one professional acting role as Tristan Zara in a production of Tom Stoppard's Travesties. On the strength of which I thought, if I'm actually going to do this, I'd better go to theater school to learn how to do it. And went to theater school in Paris for 10 months and discovered very early on in the process that much as I loved the school and what I was learning there, I was not going to be an actor. And it was, it was a clear enough, it was a thorough enough failure to take it <laughs> off the agenda. I mean, I think that was, if I thought, if I'd been slightly less bad at it, maybe I'd have just had an unhappy life as an actor who never got good roles, who was always <laughs> at the, at the, but the same kind of right thing with, The same kind of thing with oil painting. I was so bad at it that it was clearly that it had to come off the agenda and I had to find some other form, which for me was discovering engraving and etchings, legitimate monochromatic techniques, and then that became charcoal drawings. So I think one can always write one's biography as being saved by one's failures, mm. if, they're, if they're clear enough. <laughs> so the performance came from then, and... Uh, it was fine to, you know, the, the, the thing that was possible is I didn't, I was just playing one role. I was just playing... Uh, you and you. You and you, myself in the third person. It was <laughs> yeah. like a third person performance. Uh -huh. um, and every now and then I'd stop filming. I thought, no, 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 this just feels like acting. And remember, you are not an actor. <laughs> I mean, we could have had that in the dialogue about... <laughs> have, you, have you had a life as a performer and actor also? More of a performer, but I did also do two theater programs, um, but f more as a director. <laughs> I yeah. too felt a quick failure <laughs> 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 that led me in a different direction. But I like the in in the show, like the stage, like there very much feels like these stages and you've done several theater productions. So how does that kind of tie in with the other work that you're doing? Even that's you're talking right. about Vanishing Point, I guess, in some yeah. ways that's like a... Often in a theater you have that exaggerated yeah. perspective, the forced perspective of it. Um, I, there are two ways of thinking, for example, to talk, take opera as an example. You can think of directing an opera the way the opera house thinks of it. You're the hired hand. Come and be the director. You've got six weeks. Come and do your job, and thanks, and that's it. Or you can falsely, but think of it the way I like to saying, here's this wonderful opera house that said, we're giving you a canvas that is mm. 51 feet across and 32 feet high, and you've got three hours to make the drawing. But not only that, we're going to also give you 80 musicians and put them at your disposal at the front, and we'll find some of the best composers in the world to write music for you, and great libretto. And not only that, we'll give you a chorus of 20 people and some actors. And it's like this extraordinary ongoing drawing which they're inviting you to make. 
uh, which is much more comforting to think about than saying, oh God, you're here for the six week, tell people where to go and, and be done with it. But most of the work, even when it's in theater, most of the work, the months before, sometimes the years before, is doing the drawings which are going to be projected with it. And then also, the most exciting part is we have workshops for all theater projects, whether it's for an opera in whatever city. Mm -hmm in the, my studio in Johannesburg. We might gather 30 people, some dancers, actors, if it's new music that we're making, composer, musicians, and uh, I'd obviously have to have some vague idea where we're beginning. It doesn't begin from nowhere. But it's the excitement of seeing things emerge uh, and being open to recognize something rather than knowing it. And there's a... I'm sure, as you know, moments when things come together, either on the camera or on the canvas or in front of you, that's, that's what one lives for in no, the I studio. I love the music, all the music that's in yeah. the piece and all the singers, incredible. Music, and there is uh, an element of dance and movement, and it's some of the most alluring moments uh, in the series are, are, are moments of, of dance. And it, what, what is interesting to me about it is the way that it makes manifest the deep correspondence between dancing and drawing, that it is a kind of mark making as well. Um, I'd love to just know the genesis of some of those, those moments. Well, there was one project I did some years ago about the nature of time. And I worked with a wonderful dancer, Dada Masilo, uh, who's one of the great dancers from South Africa. And when I was coming to do the series, I thought, who are all the people I've loved working with? Let me see who I will invite into the studio to show. Because to show, I mean, from, one could make a series just about drawing in the studio, but in my studio, that's one component, but the work with other people is important, which is why I, early on I made a list of people I'd love to come in, most of whom are in the series. Some, there wasn't space for everyone. But... Um, I said to Dada, who dances, says, come on here, I'm your subject, you can, do choreogra you can choreograph me. How are you going to choreograph something for a 67-year-old man who can't really move, he's sluggish, okay. and... You're, you're uh, moving a little And she, yeah, yeah, she told me, she told me, and it was like, you know, it's one step, you know, one to the right, one to the other, and then I pirouette, and I try to pirouette and stop. And it's kind of blessed by the editing, because as I stop, we could cut before I fall over, and then we go, and it looks kind of quite sharp and, and do it. But the, and we used to do a, a very nice du uh, we did a very nice duet in it where we would d dance together. But yeah. she was able to lift her leg up so that it was over there, and I would stand next to her and I would do that. And we were in, <laughs> we were parallel to each other. So there were um, there was a series which I, I always wanted to do with her, and we may still, which should be dancing for those who should know better. <laughs> and, um, so it's, I mean, in the, in the theater school, although it was, a, it was not a school for spoken text, it was a school for movement. Mm -hmm. So the sense of where the origin of a movement comes from and the exercises we did daily at the school were not dance exercises, but they were very much awareness of where does meaning come in the... There was a stupid exercise we did every week we had to practice it, where you start by kind of touching your toes, which I'm not going to try to do now, <laughs> and then in one movement you stand up vertically. And the, that's, that's easy enough to understand and you can practice it, but it was to have just enough energy in that first impulse such that you would neither have to push yourself to the top nor stop yourself from going too far. Mm. And in that, if one could understand what that meant of the distant end of a starting origin of an impulse, whether it's a drawn mark or a voice or a breath or a physical movement, it kind of was a fundamental lesson that still sticks with me. And many exercises, many, many physical exercises that you could study and learn or practice, not master, but practice, which were kind of both physical and metaphoric in how one completes a gesture, how it makes a meaning. And so the dancers, uh, dance. And in Johannesburg, we have, uh, you know, we have, I don't know if it's more than other places in the world, but so many fantastic dancers to, to work with that are, that I work, that I work with. One of the interesting, again, points of argument between these two selves is precisely this. One says, I love the solitariness of drawing, and the other says, I love collaboration. And both of you have worked very collaboratively, co collaboratively across your careers. 
I wonder what that is like, the sort of, when one thinks of art, one does think of some sort of like solitary contemplation as being fundamental to it, but what is that balance between lonely work and collaborative work? I mean, I think they kind of go back and forth for me. Like, after I do a project with a bunch of people, mm -hmm. I kind of just want to be yeah. <laughs> by myself on my laptop in bed like that. <laughs> the otter position? Yeah. Yes. I mean, <laughs> it's well, well, well documented. This. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I would do it. Exa my, I have this image of a sine curve yeah. that goes above the horizon, below, and up. And so, it's when you're working, there's a pleasure of working by yourself. But after a certain point, oh, the pleasure of having a group of other people to think of the problems and to work with. And after a period with many people in the studio, the great pleasure of being on your own. So it's exactly as you described it, that an oscillation, which feels now very natural. First, it felt like, oh, here's a big change of gear, and now it really doesn't, uh, it feels, I can't imagine working in any other way than that. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. just trying to stay in the flow of that feeling. And I think yeah. when you were talking about the dance, actually, I was thinking about just the physicality of your practice in general, like how your, your body in the space and also the extensions. And I mm -hmm. think like how you're describing the operas, okay, I have this three hour giant canvas. I think it's some, some projects, the collaboration is like that and others it's more, um, a council, you know, like yeah. we're figuring it out in a different way. But I think there's, um, yeah, like it just reminded me of the extension. It's like a way of expanding what you're doing. Yes, I think that the, um, I have a friend who works in German theater who works in that. And she always describes f how the first three weeks they sit at the table with the dramaturg and the director and they're just talking. And I think, but how can anybody tolerate that? <laughs> how can that be? How can that be done? And uh, I also know that if that happens, there's certain people whose voices will be heard a lot, and other people who feel pushed into a silence. Some people who are easy in that kind of discourse. There's, you get the imbalance between people who've come through th a university with a whole set of languages and others. So the principle of working in our workshop is that it's almost all on the floor, being done, found, finding it out uh, there, finding how things mean and what they mean um, in that space. So I sometimes think, okay, I must remember that we must think a bit and talk a bit. Mm. But um, most of the productive work is saying to someone, we um, think about wanting to go to war and not wanting to go to war. Mm -hmm. Wanting to be the pride of being a, a French soldier lauded by France for saving the country or wanting to understand you're living in Senegal and what has France ever done for you? And that sense of wanting to go and out. So I might explain or describe that, but then say, so let's find, can we find a physical spasm? But uh, then kind of it's lead and flies with the dancers and yeah. um, and it's so it's sometimes even less than that I mean let's just say the trouble try to salute and fail at saluting that's enough of an impulse rather than a long discussion of colonial history yeah. and um, <laughs> scintillating of course and uh, if you know it, it comes through what you're seeing, you suddenly say, "Okay, that moment." I mean, so with those with the two dancers I was working with there, initially it was uh, very balletic, mm. uh, the dancers and the salute, and the it became, and then gradually, bit by bit, as we did it, we said, "Okay, let's take away all the dance, just keep the actual impulse and the actions," and it became a devastating, completely. De we knew that was the emotional heart of what we were doing. Um, so it was about recognizing, okay, that's actually, that's where the heart of it is. It's not in showing their physical skills. It's in that stare, that look in the hand that couldn't quite ever quite make it to the head. Mm -hmm. um, so I think for me that, that category of recognition rather than knowledge is a very central wow. one and one that we rely on. I'm sure we both rely on. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. It's kind of like 
I try to externalize the idea really quickly, whether it's a sketch or with people acting it out, saying it out loud, uh, getting it out in some form because it's like that becomes something I can manipulate rather than it being like thinking just in my head. And I think you actually say that in the last episode, something like the work is the thinking mm -hmm. and like the making is the thinking so that the mark making, whether that's with bodies in space or time or drawing, that becomes the kind of thought. It's like in that form. Yeah. So I think it, yeah, I think it, it, that's kind of a long-term question and goal. It may be wrong, but I think it's, it's important. It's not, trying, it's not an anti-intellectualism. It's trying to expand what intellectualism can be. Right. It's not saying it's against thinking, but it's saying there are other forms of thinking that we need to be open to and to, uh, and to find that there are ways of making an understanding of the world. Mm. Speaking of new ways of understanding the world, one great theme of this series is, is COVID. That there is that part of the enclosure of the studio is a kind of metaphor for the loneliness that we were all going through at that time. I wonder whether that genuinely new circumstance, globally, historically, how much of that went into the making of the, the series? Well, it, it made it possible because mm -hmm. I suddenly thought, okay, I'm going to have, uh, I didn't know how many months, but I knew several months of air traffic and you know, travel not being possible. I didn't know it would be so isolated and so cut off. I mean, in South Africa, part of the lockdown was a ban on alcohol sales and cigarette sales. Uh, I Excuse remember me? being yeah. What? Complete, yeah. Oh, you alcohol had a very sales. different experience than yeah. I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You described so the only I, two things I, I did. I know, and we had, I know, we had, <laughs> we had uh, ten, I was kind of mortified. At some point, my Good wife swapped my last bottle of whiskey for four aubergines. <laughs> it was kind of outrageous, but but to a friend whose need for the whiskey was was maybe in truth greater than mine, but still it was kind of outrageous. So she said, "But the what, lockdown's going to end. It went on for another six weeks. It was kind of, um, I think people, yeah. But it was, but so it made it possible the length of time being in the studio. It also set the parameters. You know, it wasn't then possible to say, well, let's make a documentary about South Africa, Johannesburg." circling and getting closer to the studio. It was in the studio. For, and then I'd, even when the lockdown ended, I said, let's keep it in the confines of the, of, this, of the kind of domestic studio. I have two studios, one in the garden, which is where this was filmed, and then a larger, more industrial one in town where re usually rehearsals would happen or workshops would happen where we can fit more people in. But to keep it all in the kind of the studio as a, as a hit. So it both was a practical... Mm -hmm. made it a practical possibility, but it did also give it a kind of being stuck with oneself, being stuck with oneself a lot. Even though there, I think there were six of us or seven of us living in the house that so were able to lock down us. It was a very easy lockdown compared to many lockdowns. We weren't in an apartment. We were in a house with a big garden. There were six of us together. It was, I mean, uh, it was kind of a miraculously fabulous <laughs> Quiet time, the studio, months on end in the studio, uh, the children who'd been moved out of the house coming back to live with us for a while. Um, we all got COVID at different stages, but luckily there were no disasters, which there were for many friends. For people who were dancers or musicians who are, I work with, it was extremely, extremely hard. Because, you know, if you're making drawings as I was, you could keep making, they sat in the drawer for a year, it didn't really matter. But if your dance body was unable to practice its metier for a year, that's a very depressing and very difficult thing. So I'm aware the how glib it is to say it was interesting or productive. It was both things. How did you work during that time, Martin? What was, what were you? If you if I if I can yeah, bother like you to COVID. go back into that pocket of time, uh, yeah. Definitely was smoking and drinking a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Became very knowledgeable about wines. <laughs> Suddenly had to order specialty wines all the time. Um, in the studio, in the beginning, I, I had all these shows that were scheduled, like like back to back. So it was like the first one I was supposed to go. I think I was supposed to go to Korea, and then I was supposed to go to Italy. I don't remember. I was still planning to go to Korea, and it was like the top of the week. Cases were forty. 
end of the week cases were like 5,000. I thought maybe I shouldn't go. <laughs> and then I was supposed to go to Turin for another show. And they were like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, but they were like, have you heard the news? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, it doesn't seem like I should go. But they were like, it, six weeks, yeah, a couple yeah. weeks. I did not go. Uh, but because I had been in that process, I was the first month I was still going to my studio all the time. And it was kind of freaky, cool. It was like empty streets. I live in Los Angeles, so it was like there was no one on the street. It sort of felt like I was the last person on earth. Mm -hmm. And just to change scenery, I would go from my house to my studio. Then I started biking from my house to my studio just to shake it up. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I did, I, I did a lot of drawing. Yeah. And it, yeah, it was nice. It was lonely, though. Yeah. And then at some point, everyone in my studio just started showing up again. <laughs> we didn't have any discussion. There was one day where I walked in and everyone else was in the studio. And I was like, I guess we're all just tired of being alone. <laughs> Hello again, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, uh, um, yeah, I mean, like so many people, I became an amateur statistician. Yeah. Checking the numbers in all different countries and seeing how our graph was going and where it was going down. And it was, if I look on my phone, I've got a million screen grabs of different ones to one sort of tracking site that was looking at all the numbers. I think, what was I thinking that I had to yeah. follow every number? So a few of those get into the film. There were more, but they got kind of more edited out. Mm -hmm. But um, it was very much part of that. And in a way, I think, okay, yes, the making of the series is that. You know, there were different things. In the first episode, I say, uh, in a few weeks' time or in two, no, in six months' time, my father will be 98. In, uh, will my granddaughter be born today, tonight? And in fact, my granddaughter's now four, and my father's 102, and so on. Um, it, did it did also act as a marker, kind of diary marker of that, of that period. Yeah, I was reading a lot of primary documents, like science stuff, like I could understand it. To, to your point of like expanding your knowledge, I was like reading all these reports, like I'm going to figure this one out. <laughs> and I had to, Get read, to the bottom yeah, of this I had whole to read the study, yeah. not the yes. summary of the, the study. Summary. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Martin, there you, you have a, a video that I really admire. It's called uh, This is a Studio. And it's about, you know, it, it basically shows uh, there, some alarm has gone off at your studio and a, a LAPD officer is knocking at the door of the studio. And you could see through the, like, the sort of whatever it is, a ring camera or whatever, this, like, intrusion into your art making space. And I, I think about it as kind of this, this kind of issue, a metaphor for what happens when the current events, when the headlines make it to the door of your studio. Um, I do wonder how this sort of timeless space of the studio interacts with the current day, the, the sort of current day politics, the issues of the moment, how, that, how those two realms crisscross. Sure. Yeah, I mean, with that piece, essentially, in some ways, it reminds me of like a Nauman, or that's what, not, I didn't think that at the time. At the time, I didn't know what happened. There was nothing that went off, and it was like a false alarm. So I just was, uh, I was like also renovating my studio, so it was like I was living in part of it. So it was like 3 a.m., just the cops were like knocking on my door, so I thought something had happened. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to ask them what happened, and they thought I had broken into my studio. <laughs> And so they kept trying to get me to open the door, and I was like, no, nah, I'm it's not doing that. Not it's on my ring cam, like yeah, the... So it. Yeah, so I, it was recorded, but I was like, I'm not going to open the door. <laughs> I'm definitely not going to open the door. And so um, but then later, when I was kind of thinking about it, I was like, yeah, it kind of reminded me, because I have to explain to them what it is, because it had a sign that said it was a law office. Mm -hmm. which hadn't been removed yet. So they were like, is this a law office? Who's in this place? Why is someone here right now? And I was like, it's an art studio. <laughs> like, just woke it up and trying to negotiate. And just I felt like in this very short interaction, it kind of spoke to a lot of whatever my own fears, uh, very valid fears, um, 
also just a kind of history in the in the area my studio is in also but then this kind of art historical yeah like because of some of the phrases I'm saying it did yeah remind me of this kind of now esque like outlining of the studio um but I also one of the parts I really loved in the series was when you talk about the relationship between the mining and the museum mm -hmm. and I thought that was so seamlessly done like these kind of relationships between um yeah colonialism a certain canon but also like the landscape itself and the legacies of those things and I felt like as you're kind of drawing the interior of this museum and you have that I don't know there's like a sound of a the yeah the chipping mm -hmm. that really works to blend the two together. I mean, it's the the phenomenon that of the person chipping. Um, as Martin said, Johannesburg was founded on the gold mine, and the art gallery comes from the mine owners that made made their fortune. But gradually, formal gold mining has become much less vital in South Africa. But as the economy has got worse and more and more people unemployed, there's a huge number of people that are artisanal miners that go down into the either on the surface where gold used to be or sometimes also going down deep underground, chipping away. So instead of having a mechanical grab that can grab 40 tons of rock at one moment, which is kind of conventional mining, you have someone with a blunt screwdriver and a hammer literally chipping at a rock with an empty flour sack, putting the stuff in and then grinding it under a concrete slab and then putting it in a sock with mercury and gradually trying to get a a gram of gold out of it, which then gets sold on the illegally on the informal market, but somehow, of course, makes its way into the formal market, as it was. And that was so. That's recorded in one of the in that film in that section. Since then, in fact, in the last few years, um, because there's a lot of money cumulatively to be made in this informal mining, it's all been taken over by really vicious gangs. Mm. And so people again are working for people in terrible conditions with you know no health and safety whatsoever and not even working for themselves anymore. So in a strange way that film does encapsulate that moment of that uh, artisanal mining. You know, when it was still easy, I could go and see someone actually doing it. You drive outside Johannesburg and there are people in little ditches busy chipping away. And uh, three years later, you'd need to go with an armed guard and there'd be people stopping you and they'd be wanting and it's, uh, um, it's a kind of a nightmare mm. circumstance. Not like drug gangs, but it's like prototype. Yeah. Extremely violent and uh, dangerous. So there are ways in which there are, yes, moments are, but usually in retrospect. It's not as if I was thinking, oh, this is going to disappear, so I need to catch it in this moment. Mm. That was just how it... Uh, it was, and there are, I mean, I'm always, when I look back at the series now, some of the photos I cut out of the newspaper, remember how violent the beginning of our lockdown was. There was like terror that or no food would be left, so there was kind of crazy crowds at supermarkets trying to get their last food, and the police force overreacting in the most vicious ways to enforce the lockdowns and to control, to control people. So remember, it was a kind of like a war zone atmosphere for those first, uh, not not if you're living in the white suburbs, but if you're in a black township, it was a very stressful and dangerous moment. Mm -hmm. So it does come in. It does come in in different ways, the the immediacy, but usually it filters in a secondary way. Yeah. Uh, usually, um, and we're close to our, our time, uh, I believe, um, so maybe the last question is, will be something that is usually rude to ask artists. It's usually rude to ask artists ask artists what they are going to do next or questions about the future um, because it's such an intrusion of a kind of mental privacy. But in a s series like this that is so much about the artistic process, I, I would love to hear just how, after whatever we mean by completion, how do you then begin? How do, how do you make a first mark? Um, I mean, the, 
there's been a there's been another project, a theatre project, finished since the series, but we've just begun on a new one. So take that as if the series has just finished, and it's a it's an opera, Monteverdi opera. So the music exists, and. Uh, the shape exists. So the starting point for that was saying, let's look at a range of different pieces of different kinds of filming and animation that I've done already and see how they talk to the music. So it's playing some of the Monteverdi and saying, what is, and it's astonishing how some pieces which were made with completely other music in mind still talk to that music mm -hmm. and how others absolutely don't. So it's a way of saying these are possible languages, a kind of charcoal animation that's interesting, this one of turning pages that may be interesting. Um, and that's enough to say, um, yes, I know where the first drawing might be. But the first days were looking and listening and the pleasure of seeing something come alive with the, with the music. How do you start? Well, you, I mean, I, you, you're just coming yeah. back stateside from opening a show, so maybe this is also opportunely asked to you. Well, I too have other things going still <laughs> concurrently. I like to have a few different, or maybe I don't like to, it just happens. <laughs> um, but I, what we were talking about earlier also is that some artists don't like to talk about what they're doing till it's quite far advanced yeah. or to show it. And other people need to be showing the whole time to know that. It's, <laughs> and so I'm kind of more of that that style of showing something and watching how you're looking at it. And, oh, he lost interest on this moment here. Yeah, okay, there's something wrong there. And he's still watching after 10 seconds. That's good. So that kind of not trusting my own judgment yeah. and eating others. But yeah. I think... I'm the rat in the trash can. Okay. That's like... Get out <laughs> until it's done. Um, but I always think of this lyric, actually, from this band I used to like called Bar, that just said, how do you start something? You start it. Mm. And I feel like, for me, it's very, like, immediate like that. Like, kind of how you were talking about just getting people in the room and, okay, you on start seeing it. Yeah, on your feet. Let's see this. Like, um, I feel like that's straightforwardness is part of how I work and also how I'm able to do many things mm. is I just try to get over the hump really quickly. Yeah. I just get into it. I also like being in it. Yeah. Being in it is in many ways better than being, than showing it or, or being in it is uh, in many ways, as you, as you mentioned, like the point. Yeah. 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 No, the excitement of, I mean, the energy, not the excitement, it's kind of a yeah. physical energy of things as they start to move in front of you is where one feels, okay, this is, this is what it's about. This is the, the life of it. William, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Hauser and Worth, thank you. Luby, thank, thank you. Martine, thank you. Thank you. Thank all of you.